SCP DGGE TGGE uh, variable the microbial abundance as a variable that we measure okay we we understand now that abundance is made up of two components growth after loss okay but we also know that uh, if all if all parameters are the same abundance uh, should relate to growth and also should be more when the environment is um, more productive or more there are, or if there are more nutrients in the environment uh, we know also that uh, abundance does not equate biomass okay the biomass is usually measured from uh, bio volume and we also know that there are proxy methods available to measure microbial bio abundance for samples that are harder to process okay. so these are the things that we have covered then for the different types of uh, for the different types of uh, sample for example air water and soil uh, we have to use different approaches sometimes we have to concentrate the samples and sometimes we have to dilute the samples also um, for, for soil there is very little mixing so a lot of uh, there is heterogeneity when there is little mixing that means the sample uh, is you, the, the habitat that you're looking at is probably not homogeneous so you have, you have to be careful because uh, some places will have higher abundance as opposed to others okay because there is not much mixing that can be done in soil samples this is as opposed to air and water samples where it's very it's uh, relatively more homogeneous and mixing occurs easily okay so that's another difference uh, between among these three different types of uh, sample types. Okay. So sometimes if you are you you will also be asked to swap surfaces. Okay. Uh, to look at the microbial population on surface. So when we, we are asked to do that, we will usually swap using a, a wet uh, sterile swap and we can use according to uh, the direction of the swaps we can sample like, like as shown in the figure okay in this figure so if you are doing this kind of uh, surface sampling if you know the area that you are swabbing then it, it, it is uh, it can be deemed quantitative however if you don't know the area then it becomes uh, qualitative okay so we measure abundance because it gives the preliminary it gives you a preliminary idea of how uh, how rich the environment is whether it's eutrophic mesotrophic or oligotrophic it gives you an idea only because you still have to know whether uh, the growth rate is also high or you still need to know whether the loss rate is high okay either either growth or loss should be measured okay. but that's why but because but abundance does give you an idea an indication of how productive an environment is and it, it's a it's a good way to start of the uh, your research project okay so we we know that much about the abundant microbial abundance how to measure how to use microbial abundance uh, in the context of microbial ecology so next we 
we know that uh, microbes are not made up of only one bacteria. In the environment, it's made up of many. Okay. So, here, uh, for, for the next few lectures, we'll be looking at the diversity of microbes. So diversity, microbial diversity means uh, basically it's an indication of how many types of microbes uh, you can find in the in your habitat. So the formula usually the the in index that they use is uh, Shannon's diversity index. I will send you the. Uh, the formula later, the equation for Shannon's diversity index. So the question is, what does microbial diversity tell you? Okay, let's just say if the if if one habitat has very high diversity, the other habitat has a uh, poor diversity. What does it tell you? Of but when you're talking about diversity, so you're, you're assuming that uh, when, a, when a habitat has high diversity, high microbial diversity, that means it has high abundance. And when it has low diversity, that means low abundance. Okay, uh, okay. that's acceptable, it's, it's possible. It also, but another aspect is a habitat that is relatively clean or pristine tends to have higher microbial diversity as opposed to a habitat that is polluted. Okay. So high diversity is related to uh, cleaner environments, whereas uh, lower diversity related to uh, polluted environments because when you have pollution if the pollution when you have a pollution the source of the pollution can do two things one is it starts inhibiting the bacteria the microbes that cannot survive that pollution and it propagates the bacteria that can utilize the the pollution okay the, the, the pollutant so therefore there will be a predominance overgrowth of the microbe that can use the pollutant whereas the other microbes starts to die off so the diversity changes from a community with a lot of different types of microbes it becomes predominated by one or only one or two species that can survive and do thrive in that uh, environment. Okay, that's how uh, microbial diversity, the differences in microbial diversity, can be explained. Okay, so when when scientists look at microbial diversity nowadays, they not only look at the types of species available in the habitat but from the type of species that they obtain they can estimate what kind of uh, biochemical processes are occurring in the habitat for example if you find a lot of uh, sulfate reducing bacteria then you assume that the environment the habitat is suitable for sulfate reducing bacteria there there is sulfate reducing processes occurring in the habitat okay so now we have gone uh, beyond just looking at the diversity but looking at to into the processes that are possibly occurring in the uh, habitat i use the term possibly because when we measure diversity we you we measure using dna however uh, DNA doesn't mean uh, DNA 
you cannot equate DNA with processes that are occurring. Okay? If you want to know the actual processes that are occurring in the environment, you have to extract the RNA. So RNA are the actual um, sequences that are transcribed and translated into proteins. And these proteins are the ones that are going to carry out the processes. Okay? So, uh, from the DNA extracted for 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 high throughput sequencing, you can easily know the diversity of your microbes in the environment, and then from the from that you can estimate what are the processes that may be occurring in your environment. Okay. Any questions? No, Doctor. Okay. So, we have, we have uh, culture dependent and culture independent approaches. Okay. So, the assignment that I gave to every group, those are actually uh, culture independent approaches. Okay, so that means we don't culture them. If we don't culture them, then how do we know their diversity? We know their diversity from the DNA e extracted. Okay, so for culture dependent approach, of course, we now know that it is not really uh, feasible, not a feasible approach because most of the bacteria don't grow. Okay. Uh, and using one medium will definitely not support all the types of bacteria in the habitat. Okay. So does that mean you can't use a culture dependent approach at all? If it's a small scale project, uh, probably you can still use uh, culture dependent approach if you are doing it uh, as a qualitative indicator a relative indicator so to show the differences uh, among the habitats that you are studying in terms of types of uh, culturable bacteria that you can get okay? so you must use it as a qualitative indicator. So let's just say you use Neutronega, you go to Planajaya Lake, you go to Tamanjaya uh, Lake, uh, UM Lake, and then you, you carry out spread plating, then you get your abundance, then from the from the color of color and morphology of the colony, you predict you predict the diversity of the microbes there, then it is still uh, acceptable as a relative indicator to compare the the three lakes. Okay. But of course, uh, this kind of work is probably no longer publishable. So if you need to publish your work, you shouldn't use this approach anymore. So, yeah, so for this, so we assume on the plate that different bacteria produces different colon colony morphology, but the statement is of course not the, not true because some bacteria produces the same colony. So as I mentioned, it is okay to use as a relative indicator, a qualitative uh, variable okay as a qualitative measurement okay so for culture independent approach you have cloning base then you have a uh, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis based so this is where the SSCP TDG and DGG comes in 
Okay. So this is a cloning base. And then the next one is, of course, the high throughput sequencing, uh, pyro sequence of pyro sequencing, and also Illumina, my seed and high seed. Uh, culture dependent. Then we have culture independent. Okay. Can you see what's written on, on the board? Yes, doctor. Yes, doctor. Yes. So you have cloning. Then you have your page based. So polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis based. This is CP, TGG, TGG. Then you have your uh, high throughput sequencing, your pyro sequencer. Uh, five four, and also your okay. So I L L U M I N A Illumina, my C. and high C. The principle is the same. It's just the throughput is different. This is more for a small scale throughput. This is a, a high scale throughput. But for most bacterial work, um, most of the scientists will only uh, be concerned with mycete. Mycete is enough to look for the bacterial diversity, microbial diversity. But high seed can help. Actually now, uh, most people use high seed for genome analysis, which means uh, human genomes. So if you're going for really big data, you have to use high seed to generate the data. For, for microbes, my seed is adequate. Here is for culture independent approach, you start with DNA. So DNA uh, so as a, as, oppo as opposed to RNA, DNA only shows the presence of the gene, the existence of the gene. It doesn't show you, it doesn't tell you whether the gene is being transcribed. It doesn't tell you how active uh, the bacteria is. Okay, it just tells you the bacteria is present. Okay, so you have to take that into uh, account. So, so when you need to use culture independent approach, you first need to do structure. So I'm assuming that you have sampled your sam you have done your sampling, you are satisfied with the with your sampling, you've gotten enough sample. Next is your extraction. So for DNA extraction, uh, you will have no problems with air samples, water samples, all this you need to concentrate. Okay. Same here, you need to concentrate them because you need to concentrate them so that you have enough DNA. Okay. For air, usually you have to probably go through a few hundred, lit hundred liters of uh, air. And, okay. This one, prob uh, we use usually about one to two liters of water. 
So the problem now comes with soil. Okay, DNA extraction from soil is not straightforward because in soil there are a lot of inhibitors. And as I mentioned earlier, soil, a lot of bacteria are attached. Okay. So the inhibitors, for example, your humic acid, will interfere with the downstream processing, especially your PCR step. That's why most of the uh, DNA extraction for soil samples will include a Column purification will we'll include a column purification step where you clean the DNA that you have extracted to remove possible inhibitors. Okay. So after extraction, you can either do a PCR. So when you PCR, you want to, you are focusing on diversity, so you need to focus on a gene that can reflect diversity. Okay. So which gene do you think is, so this is the gene that is the standard for uh, bacterial diversity. So from now on, our discussion is mainly on bacterial diversity. Eukaryotes will have different genes, 18S, ITS, okay. But for bacteria, we'll focus on this. So this one has, uh, it's considered the standard approach to, to determining diversity for a uh, bacteria uh, because of the when we are doing this kind of work just like identification you know, in bacteriology we need good database reliable and extensive database only then we can obtain the results that we want if your database is not strong, it's not diverse or uh, it's not extensive, let's just say you choose a, one gene, but the amount of uh, database on that gene is very limited. So you will not get good results if you're looking for diversity. Okay. You need a, a, a gene that everyone is using okay, and Everyone has deposited their sequences into the database so that you can compare and determine the microbial diversity. So this is the standard. And uh, of course, the, the, the databases that are useful are your I think I've, I've told you before. Okay. The NCBI gene bank and also the, the, the Rebel Project uh, 2. So this, ha this has extensive database on 16S and you can use this to database to compare your 16S to determine how uh, what is the diversity of your um, bacteria? So, 16S rRNA gene is about 1,525 base pairs. Okay. So, this gives you uh, enough information to determine the diversity of the bacteria. However, later on, you'll see that among the different approaches, whether SSCP, uh, T, or DGGE, 
or Illumina. The, the, the output is different, okay? This one is a 250 base pair, but they do it forward and reverse, so you can get about 500 base pair. This one is, you can get about 1000 base pair. This one is less, about maybe about 150 base pair. Then cloning is about, cloning you can go full, 1500. These numbers are limited by the, uh, the technique that you use because this type of technique, you cannot have too long a uh, uh, sequence. So this is limited by the approach that you use. Okay? But when you look at the numbers here, then you can, uh, you can assume that this one will give you a better identification okay because of the amount of information that you're getting per gene you know whereas this one maybe is hard to identify the bacteria exactly to a species level maybe you can do it to a, a family or order level but definitely you cannot go to a species level okay so different approaches have different uh, limitations which will also affect how you interpret your data later on okay any questions no no that does So, are you all familiar with the cloning method? No. Uh, have you all done your TDR? Technology DNA recombinant? Yes, less same. Recombinant. Okay. So, uh, we have extracted, let's just say we, we, we have extracted the DNA. Okay, we have cleaned it up, purified it. Then we carry out a PCR step. So we, we obtain 16S R RNA. Okay, we, have, we, we, we managed to PCR this amplicon out. So then we run it on a H, okay. agarose gel electrophoresis. Okay. Not, not polyacrylamide, but just the normal agarose. So you know that when you run, you have wells here. Okay. You load the, your DNA here. So how many bands will you see here? Of course, you have to have your ladder, DNA ladder. You have nice ladder. We use ladder to indicate the size of the, the amplicon. So whenever you do PCR, you must always also have a positive and a negative control. Okay, so how many bands do you see here? Anyone want to try? Do you see many or do you see one? Maybe. Everyone agree? Yep. 
Yes. Maybe. Anyone don't agree? So this agros gel electrophoresis will separate your DNA according to size. Okay? The larger your DNA fragment, the migration slows. Right? So the size when the size is large, the migration slows. So when the size is small, the migration is faster. So you see your DNA will uh will move according to size okay so that's why when you have a ladder you will have bands showing the different sizes of your dna you are amplifying 16s rrna you know it is 1500 base pair so you should only get one band because the 16S rRNA of all the bacteria are the same gene. That's why you only see one band. Okay? Just because you saw one band, you saw you are seeing one band because they are of the same size. But that doesn't mean they are of the same sequence. It is the sequence variation that determines what species it is, not the size of the gene. Okay? The size of the gene is always the same. It doesn't change. But the sequence change. The sequence is different from the different bacteria. That is why you need to resolve the, uh, the 16S. So, so if you know that there's only one band, why do you still run it? We don't know. We don't know whether there's any contamination. We don't know whether we want, we run the gel after you do a PCR to see how clean is your product before you send for sequencing or before you do the next step. Okay. That's why we uh, run the gel. Okay. So now we have the amplicon. The amplicons are out. The amplicons are all uh, double band, du double stranded like this. Okay. You know they're different. So you have to find a way to uh, separate them out. So you have to sep find a way to resolve them. Okay. To to separate them. So all the approaches that we've mentioned, the SSCP, DDGE, cloning, uh, the high throughput sequencing, the yeah, difference is how they separate all this uh, 16S rRNA. How they carry out the, the resolution, the separation of this amplicon. So if you remember in your cloning TDR, for cloning you need you need a vector, yes. So your vector is usually a, a plasmid. A, uh, plasmid is circular, of course, because before you once you have your vector, this is your the amplicon, you need to ligate them okay, using ligase. But before you do the ligation, you have to, of course, linearize your vector. And you join them up together so that you get your nice okay, you have a nice vector with your with the 16s inside okay. but this is still all in one tube 
you need to separate them out and in cloning we use uh, uh, we use a host E. coli okay which should transform transformation of the E. coli if you're using the TA cloning kit DH no. usually the cloning procedure follows the the the, the kit that you you're buying okay so cloning kits are available commercially so when you buy the kit they'll give you the the cells and also the vector and they will give you the steps to to produce it so during transformation your E. coli you mix your E. coli together with the vector and after transformation the E. coli will have the plasmid. Okay. And then on a petri dish, you can select for them. So it's a um, blue-white selection based on the X X gal X gal the sugar. Essentially, what it means is if your if your vector doesn't have an insert. It will be able to process this and form a blue color, blue colony. But if your but if your plasmid has an insert, then it won't be able to process the X gel and it'll be white. So from here you will know which transformant has the insert. Then you have to carry out a PCR to confirm it and then send for sequencing. But how many colonies must you pick? Okay. Usually in one transformation step, you can have thousands of colonies. Are you going to sequence everything? Are you going to pick everything? Oh. If you're no. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> why Why no? You know that? You don't have enough time. Okay, so uh, I had a student who did this once. Um, ended up, she did about three hundred. Three hundred over. So she screened three hundred over colonies. Uh, but we use this cloning approach because she was targeting the Archaea. Okay. So this is Archaea 
for Arkea, it's better to have longer sequence so you, that you can identify it better. If you were to use other approaches, TGG or or even high seed and my seed, you might not get good identification because of the, the smaller number of uh, information available. Okay. So the approach that we use to determine how when to stop, we call it a uh, refraction. This is analysis, refraction. So essentially, uh, you have to, maybe you, you start off with, uh, let's just say you can do only about 30 colonies at once. Okay, you can do only 30 colonies each time can't handle too much so after PCR what we usually do is we'll do an RFLP you remember what is RFLP breast seed length, length polymorph or something like that so this is uh, restriction, restriction, fragment, length, polymorphism. Okay, RFLP. Essentially, what it means is you have, well, after your PCR, you'll have your 16S sequence here. What you do is you add restriction enzymes to it. You cut it and then you will get patterns okay we usually use three restriction enzymes to generate different types of patterns and then from the patterns you will know whether your back your insert is uh, new or not or something that you have already done So how does refraction work? So you have a lot of colonies. So you did it. You did the first, the first stage, thirty colonies. Then you find, oh, maybe about uh, twenty OTUs. OTUs are con So it's so based on your study and one OTU is one species. So this is not actually based on the database yet, but based on your study, maybe based on the different RFLP patterns that you see, this is new. This is one OTU. Okay? Of course you still need to sequence it later, but so from 30 colonies first stage you get this amount of new OTU. Then from the second 30, you get additional new OTU. Additional, additional. Because uh, when you're doing your PCR step, the amplification will amplify some of the genes, or some of the genes, some of the similar sequences also. So there will come a time when even when you do more uh, screening, you'll find that you are no longer adding onto new OTUs, which means although you're doing more work, but you're not finding new OTUs. So at that time, at that stage, you can stop. Okay, so you don't need to continue screening because this is probably the extent of the richness that you can find. Okay, so how rich? So if this is based on one habitat, one sample,
So this is the level of richness in your sample. Richness means the number of OTUs that are available in your sample. So no point going all the way to 300, going all the way, screening 1000 if, if by screening until here is enough. Okay, so that's how you use okay, refraction. So if you have five, six stations, then when you when you do this, you will find out that you find that they have different stations will or may have different levels of richness. Any questions? So now you know uh, when you can stop your screening and then from the RFLP patterns you can send the unique ones send for uh, single sequencing single sequencing is the traditional uh, sequencing approach where you can get the full 16S RNA sequence. Then from the sequence, you can compare to the database uh, whether NCBI gene bank or your RDP2. Then you will get your uh, identification. Okay. Then from the identification, once you have all the species out, you can do the uh, genes. Okay. You can do the Shannon's diversity index calculation. So any questions about this? Nope, no questions of Adapter. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, we have the page base. Okay. So page base is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis base. How does it differ from agarose? It differs from agarose based on the, the resolution. So page base, when you run a polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, your bands can separate based on one one base difference okay so page can show one base difference whereas agarose is about 10 to 15 base okay so the resolution here is not enough to tell you to resolve your uh, 16S based on sequ sequence differences. Okay, so you need polyacrylamide gel when you're doing diversity work. Okay, uh, let's start with uh, SSCP. So SSCP stands for sin single stranded conformational polymorphism. So single stranded means it works with a single strand. So it's short. Okay. Cannot be long. It has to be short. So about maximum is 150 basis. So from your from 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 your DNA sample, 
you carry out a PCR to generate single strand of the gene that you're interested in. Because of the limited size of steps, limited size here, they usually target very specific families or very specific order. This is not usually used for full microbial diversity. Okay. Usually you you are already you already have a target of interest, maybe uh, in the family uh Vibrinaceae, okay, or Pseudomonadaceae. So you already know uh, what family you are target you are interested in and you want to know the species diversity within that that very uh, net family. Okay. So you, because the gene that the sequence that you can work with is very short, so you have to be very specific here. So once you generate the single strand, the principle is when it's single strand, it's not stable, it will start conforming into a, a 3D structure. It will self anneal into a different 3D structure. So this is based on the, the sequence itself. So different sequences will give different structure. Okay. So that is the principle of SSCP. So different struct different sequences will give this different structure. Next, you run a page. Okay. Then when you run your sample, because they have different structure, their migration will also be different. Okay, the migration through the polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis would be different. So, although you have many single stranded of the same size from different from different bacteria, but because the sequence is different within this. Uh, PCR products, they will conform differently and then they will migrate at a different pace. Once they migrate at a different pace, they will separate and you will be able to see uh, the separation. Then you have to extract the, cut out the gel here, cut it out, extract then uh, extract the, the DNA from here and then uh, send for sequencing. Okay, so that will tell you uh, the, the types of microbes in the, that you have in your habitat. Okay, any questions? Mm. Doctor, so for the um when we done the sequencing, we must um we must uh cut all the sequence on the gel, and we must sequence it again to find types of organism, or we just need to use one sequencing only. No, no, no. You have to sequence all of them okay. because sometimes, sometimes. Even though they are on the same place, they might be different. So initially, you have to sequence them. And sometimes, although we say they can resolve each other, sometimes you get two different types of uh, DNA inside one band. So usually, Usually, when 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 researchers use this approach, they are they just want to see whether it, it differs. Okay. So this approach started out in uh, medical micro me, medical genetics. They were looking at. Uh, SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So for that for that kind of work, 
this one more than uh, suffices. Single type, single nucleotide polymorphism. So once there's a single nucleotide change, you are able to see it on a SSCP um, gel. But for diversity, it probably helps if you're doing a comparative. Okay, comparative analysis. So when you compare different habitats using the same approach, you will see where where which habitat has a higher richness, more bands, or which habitat has similar bands. Okay, so if you have similar bands, okay, for example. So you have lots of gel. So you're running the same method. Then you have uh, no you have different things here. Yeah. Okay. So if you're running the same method SSCP and you're working with uh, okay six sites, okay you run six sites, and you run the gel and you get this kind of results. So, discuss. What can you say? Anyone? F contain more DNA sequencing. Uh, I mean, uh, more species. Yeah. May maybe um, uh, more species. Uh, yeah, more, more, the, don't say species yet because we, we didn't sequence it. We, you can use the term OTUs, okay, operational taxonomic units, okay, because we didn't sequence, we, we didn't really determine the identity, identity, but you can use OTUs because you can say that was each band represents one OTU, okay, so here F is shows higher richness yeah richness is the number of uh, different OTUs that you can find in within the same habitat higher richness very very low uh, richness okay what can you say you can say about the richness high low you can also say that hey this one is very strange out of six stations, four has the same band. That means this bacteria, this OTU, is predominant. Okay, you can find in many places. Okay, then you can say that uh, C is very very different from the rest. Uh, yeah, basically you can compare the bands and. Uh, discuss make assumptions about the richness the diversity uh, the predominance the rare rare sequence rare, rare, sometimes you have rare sequences here okay, depending on what the the bands that you see okay any questions No, that there. Okay. So next is the TGG and DGG. 
Okay, so this is also page base. This is a denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis. This is temperature gradient gel electrophoresis. Denaturing. So uh, denaturing. So what is different here is So this is the concentration of the denaturant in the gel. So they usually use uh, urea. So the difference between the SSCP is, for SSCP, you don't need any special equipment, you can just uh, use a simple uh, uh, gel casting system for, for, for page and then you just run it but I have to run it cold so usually you have to run it in the cold room at 4 degrees Celsius because it runs hot when you run a page it runs hot so you have to cool it down For, for DGGE, the preparation of the gel itself is uh, unique. When you prepare the gel, when you're stacking the gel, the concentration of the denaturant here is highest. Then it decreases with time. Uh, dec decreases as it goes up. Okay. So the, the principle here is you have your your amplicons here, okay, you have your amplicons here, they're all the same size, but you know they are different sequences, they are of different sequences. And you know that G binds the C in a, with a triple bond, whereas A binds the T a double bond. Okay. So as you increase the denaturant, the sequences with more AT will denature. Okay, whereas the sequences with more GC will remain stable. Okay, once the the sequence, once the amplicon denature, it might it stops its migration. So you have different bands based on uh, where based where it denatures. So here means, probably if you see bands here, uh, that means they are, takes a long time for them to denature. A lot of GCs here, and here a lot of ATs. Okay? Any questions? Do you understand the principle? Uh, urea plus formamide. Any questions? So for this, you have to maintain the temperature also. So usually, usually it is run in a in a in a, a vessel where the water is circulated around the gel to cool it down to maintain the temperature. Okay. Because you do not want the the amplicons to all denature here. they usually add a GC clamp. So when, when, they are, when they are carrying out the PCR, they will add a GC clamp about for 30 to 40 base pair GC clamp to the amplicon. This is to ensure that they are more stable and they are able to migrate over 
a, a longer distance. If you don't add the GC clamp, everyone, er, most of the applicants will denature at the same place near the well and you won't see any patterns. Okay. Any questions about this? No question, Doctor. Okay. So this is how the DGG works. TGG is similar, except that the amount of denaturant doesn't change. But it is the temperature that changes. Okay? So the temperature increases with time. So when when though as it migrates, the temperature increases. So if it is very stable, lots of GC, only when the temperature is very high, it will stop in, in its migration. So for those that are high in 80, it will stop migrating uh, very fast, even when the temperature is low. So the temperature will increase with time. Okay, so this is, that's the main difference between TGGE and DGGE. So as uh, similar to SSCP, once they have migrated, you can cut it out, then extract the DNA, and then send for sequencing. Okay. You can assume every band as an OTU. And from there, you can calculate the richness, you can calculate the diversity. So when, when you're looking at cloning approach, you can see that, well, oh, you can get easily uh, hundreds of, uh, hundreds of uh, colonies, you know, no, thousands of colonies. And from the thousands of colonies, you can get hundreds of OTUs easily. However, you know, when you're running a gel base, uh, a page base, PGG or SSCP, you, you won't get a lot of bands. At most, you get 20 or 30 bands. So does that mean the diversity is like that? That's, that, that's the amount of richness? No. So definitely, you are underestimating here. So that's why when you are working with uh, approaches that have limitations like that, it is best that you use it for comparative studies. Okay, that means uh, it's good uh, when you can compare several sites. Then you can, as I've done before, you can see which site has higher diversity, which site has lower diversity, richness, and all that. Okay, so it still has value as a comparative in comparative studies okay but if you're talking about uh, actual diversity probably uh, cloning and uh, the high throughput sequencing will will be uh, more reliable but you must also understand that the The ability to estimate the diversity depends very much on the strength of the database. So that's why uh, all every scientist is uh, recommend is 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 recommended. They are they are they are asked encouraged to deposit the sequence that they have in NCBI and RDP so that uh, whenever we we search the database we'll be able to get a hit okay not, yeah it's not not that straightforward nowadays not so straightforward so now 
in the past, uh, high throughput sequencing is very ex was very expensive, easily three thousand, four thousand per sample. <laughs> now, can you guess how much it costs to do a high throughput sequencing on a uh, yeah on the sample for microbial diversity? Anyone? Hundreds. Yo, that is that is such a. Oh yeah, uh, okay. It costs about uh uh two to four hundred, depending on the amount of database, the amount of data you require. So if you want.